Well, let's go to our first caller. It's Charles in Tottenham. Hello, Charles. Hello, Billy, and nice to speak to you. Uh, Hi, nice what would you like to ask? A nice to speak to the panel. Panel, would you agree with me that the unions are holding the country to ransom? Catherine McKinnell, Labour MP, are the unions holding the country to ransom? Surprise us with your answer. Well, <laughs> no. Um, I mean, clearly, I think the Twitter poll that um, LBC have recently just announced the results of, um, I would agree with the 71% that believe the responsibility for this lies very squarely with the government. I think we are seeing the result of 12 years, I would say, of running this country down, of holding back pay, of making life increasingly difficult. And we're now clearly reaching this crunch point where there is just no give left in the uh, private sector. There's no give left in the public sector. And these strikes are a last resort. And the government need to get to the table and enter proper good faith discussions to reach an agreement so that we can all get on with our lives. The workers, the public that need these services um, and the uh, government needs to get on with growing the economy so we can get out of this mess instead of just fighting with the people that we're relying on to get this country moving. It's not necessarily the government so that is the employer, is it? In the rail dispute, they're not the employer. The or government fine. have the mandate for these rail agreements and they have failed to enter into serious and genuine discussions for a very long time. The current uh, Secretary of State has made a small bit of progress compared to what's been happening to date, but it's too little, too late, and the chickens are coming home to roost for, for, for um, this situation that the government, have, quite frankly, have created and they need to get round the table and sort it out. OK, Kip Malthouse. Well, of course, the unions are using strikes to exert pressure. That's what strikes are for, right? You withdraw your labour to try and exert a bit of, of pressure, and they're trying to get <coughs> things for their um, uh, members, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. The question is whether they're doing it in proportion, um, and no one set of workers is the same. So, for example, the fire brigade, um, who I see we're demonstrating today, right? The government is not the employer there. Local authorities are the employer, or, or fire authorities. Um, for nurses, there's an independent pay review body that's come up with a... Um, a proposal which the government is complying with and paying. I had to do that with the police when I was policing minister, 5% across the board. Um, and, you know, the RMT, as you said, the government are not actually completely uh, the employer there. The rail companies are. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's kind of different for different sets of employees. Do I think that ministers should uh, be stepping forward and, and um, not necessarily directly um, involving themselves in negotiation, because that's a kind of skilled practice, which it's easy to fall foul of, uh, but certainly engaging themselves in the process, I think, will be helpful. And, and I think Mark Harper at Transport has been doing that. Well, what are um, the answer to the question? Does the panel think rail workers are holding the country to ransom? So the rail workers are obviously exerting pressure at particularly sensitive time. I mean, the run up to Christmas is a time at which lots of people rely on the rail uh, network to get around and see their families. And of course, they're using maximum leverage to try and get what they can. Do I think it's warranted in the face of whatever I think 8% that they've been offered? Actually, I don't, no, because the country is short of money. Well, it, we haven't got it, enough money to pay everybody. It's actually 8% we want, over two years. Well, so. okay, but, but, you know, we want to make sure that things are fairly... Um, uh, parceled out, and I guess the government is trying to to do that. And while everybody, I agree, we live in a country now where pretty much everything, if the weather's bad, it's the government's fault. Um, at the same time, people point to the government and say it's their fault, but then they fall short of saying that they would actually give the unions exactly what they want. I'd be interested to know if Catherine would give the nurses 17% or would give the RMT what they want. And it's, it's fair to say that all politicians sometimes struggle. So if you look, for example, we're sitting here in the centre of London, right? Sadiq Khan came in to be mayor of London, said there'll be absolutely no strikes under my um, uh, mayoralty, you know, I'll do deals with the unions, I'll be fine. In fact, we've had more industrial action in London on the tubes uh, with the RMT than we ever had in the whatever, I think, combined two mayoralties before. So, you know, these are sensitive issues that need to be handled, but at the moment, when the country is short of cash, I think that we all have to kind of be realistic about what's affordable. OK. Matthew Holbert, um, are the rail workers holding the country to ransom? Well, good evening, Ian. It's both exciting and nerve-wracking to be here, so um, good to be with you. Um, in answer to Charles' question, no, they're not holding uh, the country to ransom. They are doing what is their human right 
to down tools if they feel they're not being given a fair deal by their employers and or uh, this government. Now, would it be better if they didn't have to strike? Of course it would be, and people's lives will be disrupted. And that is a, you know, a really sad thing, and I just hope that, that no tragic incidents occur uh, as a result of some of these strikes. But is it their human right to do so? Yes, it is. And there's a choice that governments can make in this kind of situation, Ian. They can either choose to be proactive and to engage in the situation, to encourage talks, if talks break down to, you know, get back, get people back around the table, or they can choose to do, I'm afraid to say to to Kit, who seems like a good guy, what this government aren't, uh, what this government are doing, which is to take a laissez-faire attitude and say, not me, Gov. Well, they're the government of the day. Only they have but a mandate they, to they, get they, people back they, around the table. Certainly in the RMT dispute, they did take that attitude. I don't think the previous two, trans or is it three, transport secretaries actually met with the RMT. Mark Harper's taken a different approach, Indeed. and as Catherine acknowledged, he has sat down, and all the indications were that progress was being made. And then, of course, yesterday, we hear that the RMT say, no, actually, we're going to extend the strike action now. We're going to do it from the 24th to the 27th. Now, a lot of people say, well, that doesn't matter because the train lines don't work from the, uh, from the end of the 24th to the 27th. But, of course, it means that the engineering works that would normally take place can't take place now. Mm -hmm. So that will have consequences down the line. So you can understand why Charles is asking that particular question. I mean, there is a presentational issue here and judgment for the unions as well, because I think at the moment, public sympathy is with the unions. And I think we've seen that from your polling here at LBC. But there's always a judgment and there's always a tipping point where people think, actually, you're disrupting me just a little bit too much. Well, Steve here. Norris was here earlier and that's exactly the point he was making. Oh, he, right. th he thinks that what Mick Lynch announced yesterday might be the tipping point. Amy Hart, where do you stand on this? So, first of all, solidarity to everyone striking. I am very up the workers, so I don't think they're holding the country to ransom at all. I think they're doing what they need to do. Striking is a last resort. Um, I used to work in an industry where striking was a thing. I used to be an air hostess. I remember as a very wide-eyed... You're allowed to say air hostess nowadays. Do I you? don't. Because flight, flight, flight crew. No, some people are cabin crew and some people are air hostesses. I was oh, an air hostess, okay, fine. darling. Um, <laughs> no. So, I, I remember as I've a very... I've been called darling on this programme. <laughs> <laughs> so rude of me. Um, so as a very wide-eyed 18-year-old who got an email from the union to say that, you know, the pay talks hadn't gone well, I'm like, oh, my God, are we going to go on strike? This is so exciting. And I remember someone sitting me down, down route, and saying to me, Amy, a strike is not exciting. Mm. You will lose friends. Like, you'll get sent letters from people telling you, like, why you need to go back to work. You'll have friends that will go to work. Your friends and family will be against you. The media will be against you. It is a last resort, and it is not fun and that was always really drummed into me so I really understand and I do think they're very brave I remember um my my base couldn't go on strike but another base did go on strike and I had a friend who was 19 years old and she went on strike and I sent her a message and said hi darling like are you all right like if you need anything just and she's basically her mum and dad was so anti-strike and she still lived at home they said if you go on strike you can't live here anymore so she had to move wow. in with her grandparents because um she believed in it so much so I think the strikers are really brave just to say I mean I think it it kind of depends on the union you could i mean nurses obviously i think the if they do strike it's going to be the first strike in their history but for a lot of people i think it feels like the rmt are on a hair trigger um i mean certainly if you try and get around london over the last few years you know the tube has been continually on strike and we've had a series of of rail strikes over the last few months despite them going back and back as as matthew said back and back to the negotiating table so i think it kind of depends and the the problem we've got i think at the moment for the government frankly is that all these strikes are being conflated in together whereas actually the issues for each strike are very different um, and require different solutions. And I have to say, certainly when I was Secretary of State for Education, I met with the unions regularly, and we were in the sort of precursor to their very concerns about both pay, um, and I thought we made a good pay offer, but also funding into schools, and happily in the budget we managed to get more funding into schools. So you, know, you can have a, a relationship, and I think when I was Fire Minister, I met Matt Rack at the FBU a couple of times as well. Not that that was necessarily a productive meeting, but because um, he's quite a challenging character, but... Um, 
you know, as I say, it's often more complicated and there are different solutions required well, for each I different I suppose the, the, the argument about um, whether it's the government's fault or not, in the end, if it's a public sector dispute over pay, and I know a lot of these disputes are more than about pay, the government is, is the paymaster of last resort. And Matthew, I know you work in youth services and youth services have experienced a lot of cuts over the years Indeed. and you have to work within a budget and if the, if the paymaster of last resort isn't going to give you any more money uh, you either can't give a pay rise or you have to cut staff that there, there's no, there as someone once said there is no alternative but there, but there is always an alternative, isn't there? The, the, the alternative is engaging and getting to a situation that both sides can agree on. And I'd like to ask Kit, and I agree that Mark Harper appears to be a more serious person than his predecessors, and I appreciate that, and he deals with these things seriously. But I'd like to ask Kit, do you think the government should be more active than it's being in some of these cases? Well, as I say, I think it, it varies from, from industry to industry. You know, and so, for example, in, in the health service, obviously there is a, a, a devolved structure that and, a, and an independent pay review body that looks at nurses' pay and that has agreed a figure and the government has agreed to that figure. And once you start departing from that, then you undermine the whole process. We had the same process with policing. On transport, but, but why doesn't for example, Stephen DfE, Barclay, the health secretary, can. come out and say what you've just said? Because no, no health, I can't remember seeing a health minister on the media over the past few weeks while, while this strike ballot was going on. It's, it's bizarre. Can I just... They have to invite them on in, but... Well, but the, believe me, we do the all the time, and oh, that yeah. they, not just this programme, but across the media, there seems to be a blanket decision by Number 10 Downing Street not to put ministers... They don't even do the morning rounds anymore yeah. as a matter of routine. But well, can, can I just make the point, yeah, though, that this, this is, yes, this is about strikes, this is a last resort, but this is also about a workforce that is absolutely at the end of their tether, they're at the end of their limit, they are understaffed, they are overworked, and now they are being asked to do it for a significantly less pay due to inflation, but also on the back of um, years of suppressed pay. So it's, it's not just about... Um, not getting enough pay and the cost of living crisis that everyone is facing. It's on top of years of underinvestment in public services and in our railways. And as someone that travels up and down the East Coast Main Line every uh, week, I know how underinvested. I'm chair of the All Party Group on what. the East Coast Main so Line. Just, just trying to secure you're not on the West investment. Coast. Yeah, well, right. I know the West Coast <laughs> so is Ka not good so either. Catherine, I'm assuming um, from that that you would give the RMT. All of this is underinvested for um, many, many years. Yeah, but I'm assuming it's, therefore, it's broken. The looking forward, broken. Catherine, that you would we give the RMT. Okay. Hold on, hold on. You would give the RMT what they want. You would not modernise the network in, that in a way that, I'm not right, in that negotiation room. I'm not in that negotiation room. And I but also know, little things like would you would you agree to seventeen percent for nurses? Little things. Um, I know that uh, you know listening to the negotiations about terms and conditions that we're talking about um, serious changes to people's lives not just their amount of pay, but the way they live their lives and the job that they do and the mm -hmm. job that they love and they want to go and do, they don't want to be on strike. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in reality, we, we've just broken so many of these public services after 12 years. And, um, I mean, in my view... <laughs> We need a new government that they can have some faith in, that we can okay, negotiate then. in good right. faith and well, take a new direction. We need to move on. Uh, somebody has, tweet, has texted this. A Twitter poll on LBC means nothing. LBC is a left-wing station. Well, thanks for that. <laughs> thanks for that insight. It is for part of the morning, Ian. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not going there. It's 16 minutes past eight. Safe by the bell. This is LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 Kit Malthouse, Catherine McKinnell, Amy Hart and Matthew Hobbit with us answering your questions. Uh, we have a text question from Kevin in Nottingham who says, should ambulance workers be banned from striking? Matthew. In direct answer to the question, no, they shouldn't be banned from striking, but it's difficult and it's especially difficult for me. So in July, my mum fell at home uh, in the early hours. Um, she hurt her ribs when she fell. Um, we got to her. We obviously didn't move because she'd hurt her ribs. And um, we called an ambulance at 5.01 a.m. And a paramedic finally arrived at 4 p.m. Mm. Uh, and my dear mum died two days later. Mm. So, of course, if, you, if ambulance workers strike, that is bound to have some impact on what is already a distressed service. But I just want to say this. I feel really sorry for the paramedics who get into that profession because they care for people and they want to help people and they want to get to people in a timely manner. And I think I've been having meetings in Parliament today. I sat in the gallery and, and watched the health debate that, that, that happened today. And I've met tonight with Wes Streeting and earlier today with the Lib Dem spokesperson, Daisy Cooper. And I'd happily meet with Tory MPs and ministers too, if they wanted to meet with me. And what I've been impressing on people, Ian, is that we need system-wide change. Because the issue with my mum partly was that ambulances were backed up at Leicester Royal Infirmary, I've been mm. told by East Midlands Ambulance Service, um, therefore weren't able to get out to the likes of my mum in a timely manner. Um, and people are suffering, and families, I can tell you, are suffering. And the reason is, is because we have one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, and people are really hurting. People are dying as a result of this. And so uh, would it concern me that ambulance workers were on strike? Yes, of course it would. But do they have a right to strike? Yes, they do. Catherine. Well, I mean, I think that um, put it very well. Um, I think when you listen to ambulance workers and how hard it is to do the job, how hard it is to um, be unable to get to treat the people as fast as you would like, to be stuck waiting um, in hospitals. And it is a whole system problem. And I know that we've had this um, in, in my area where the hospitals are stacked up at hospitals and they can't get out. Um, and it's just... Um, you know, it's it's a whole system failure that needs to be addressed, but absolutely fundamentally the right to strike, as we've discussed, and I think we all agree, it is a last resort. Nobody does it easily. Nobody does it willingly. Nobody does it um, as a first course of action. It's an absolute last resort, and it's only when they cannot get any change any other way and I go back to this being something that the government needs to look at and address because I appreciate there are independent pay review bodies there are independent organizations but ultimately the people that hold the purse strings the people that hold responsibility for our overall healthcare system in this country and hold um, responsibility for the welfare of the people working in these public services that from all the accounts that I hear and the people that I speak to are broken currently and um, it needs to be resolved so yes they should have the right to strike it's a fundamental right is it a fundamental right for police officers or prison officers well actually prison officers can go through well i mean at the moment I, I don't think i think the focus on trying to prevent people from exerting their voice is not the priority here i think as you say the government should come out and if they don't think that these people need to have the uh, terms and conditions and the pay that they are asking for, then the government needs to explain why. They need to explain to the country why, they need to explain to this workforce why, because at the moment all we hear are desperate voices crying for change and a government that is not listening. Uh, Ranj in Birmingham text to say, I'm a nurse, can I have the same pay review body that the MPs have to decide their salaries? Um, Ranj, be careful what you wish for, because mm. I think MPs got a 2% rise this year mm. and I think the pay review body for nurses was... Five, was it? Five, and police was five, yeah. yeah. And I, I understand the anger that people, and, and I've heard it a little bit today, um, expressed towards MPs, because there's a sense of frustration that the people who are in Westminster making these decisions aren't listening. But I would say, direct your, direct your anger and let's direct our voices to the right place, the people who have the power to change this, and that is the government. But they have accepted the independent review body. I mean, so what... 
I mean, what more are they supposed to do? What's the point of having an independent review body if you don't accept what they say? Well, I think in the ambulance service, this is a, it is a whole scale issue. It's not just to do with this immediate pay rise. It's to do with the inability to actually carry out your role because of the NHS being mm. in such crisis. Um, and so the, the NHS in it as its entirety needs reform. It, it needs can, investment. We need to get well, these we waiting lists down. But, we need, to, but does we need it, to recruit more people. People are under so much strain. But is, is they that can't down manage to their job the government or is it down to the management of NHS England? No, it's down to the government to, to put in place more recruitment plan, to put in place more funding to get the workforce in place so that the people who are doing this job day in, day out can actually get to the end of the but, day but and what, have done what, a good job rather NHS spending than over the, the last job of four 12 people. years has gone up from around 100 billion to 150 billion, when inflation, apart from the last 12 months, has been very, very low. Where has the money gone? I mean, in terms of where's the money well, gone? I mean, an extra fifty billion pounds a year since to, compared to twenty ten, mm -hmm. um, and you think, well, how much more money can the taxpayer but afford it, to put it, into but the it's NHS? It's not just about investment. It's, it's though, now is it? one, well, one in every six pounds that's spent goes into the NHS. How much more can go in? Well, as much as is needed to treat the people in the backlog that we have. I mean, we have so many people waiting for routine operations that are out of work. They could be in work. They could be okay. um, adding to the taxpayers' coffers. Right, we let, have let's um, go to Amy. waiting lists and people in pain. I don't think they should be banned from striking because, as we've said, like withdrawing your labour is a human right. I do think that hopefully the government will be able to strike a deal before it gets to that point. At the end of the day, everyone that is going on strike is just fighting for a better life for themselves and a better life for their families. Like you said, we've already got a problem with the ambulances. Mm. I wanted to have a home birth and my boyfriend pointed out, because I said, oh, but, you know, we're 20 minutes from each hospital. And my midwife said, oh, but you'll be blue lighted, you'll be blue lighted. And as my boyfriend pointed out, like blue lighted if we can get an ambulance. And so that's been absolutely kibosh now. So I think... It is, like you say, a system-wide issue and it needs to be sorted. Sensible boyfriend. Kit? So there are two things to say, really. I mean, first of all, I'm amazed, really, that over the last 30-odd years there hasn't been a kind of no-strike arrangement negotiated with ambulance workers because they're so critical for people's safety as, as Matthew found to his... But if they can't deliver the patients cost. to the hospital... Well, that's the second question that I'm coming on to. And, and if you look at the police, for example, I mean, we did have a police strike back in the 1930s, uh, which was a kind of shocker for the nation and obviously critical to our safety. And since then, the police have not had the ability to strike. But uh, as a quid pro quo for that, their terms and conditions and all this stuff are quite heavily regulated. And obviously they have a 30-year um, horizon and a pension and all those kind of things to, to compensate for it. And, um, you know, I would certainly support, uh, you know, an attempt to negotiate a kind of long-term no-strike agreement uh, with ambulance staff because they are so critical. But there is a structural problem with the ambulance service. And I was, before I was Education Secretary, I was at the Cabinet Office over the summer. And on my risk register, I had ambulances glowing kind of red hot because you could feel the structural problem. And in truth, as you might know, you know, I had a... a sort of 16 odd years in city government in London before and throughout that period the London Ambulance Service was always struggling um, and the structural problem is that they are part of a conveyor belt and if there's a blockage in the conveyor belt somewhere then they're unable to do their job and the, the, the blockage at the moment seems to be discharge from hospital. Right, the ability to discharge out into the community into social care or what used to be convalescent homes um, in the past is, is just kind of for some reason clogged up um, and that is knocking back and we see it in other areas so for example you know, the police will tell you that they're spending a lot of time sitting in uh, a and e guarding a mental health uh, case that they have recovered or rescued or gone to find what they call a misper um, and they're having to sit for six seven hours in a and e waiting because they can't access a mental health bed because one is not freed up because somebody's not released but and so i know that steve barkley is looking uh, very sharply at this conveyor belt notion and and that there are lots of hospitals now i mean certainly in my part of the country in hampshire you know, there are discharge teams that particularly focus on trying to get mm. people out back in the to create the space the ambulances but can if, deliver if, if you if you know that that's the problem and i think we all agree that that yes. is the main problem mm -hmm. getting patients who are fit to be discharged discharged i mean we we had 
Nightingale hospitals in COVID, who, which were built within like 10 days or something. Mm -hmm. Is it beyond the wit of the <laughs> NHS to requisition, I don't know, X hotels or something and, and put these people in temporarily in temporary accommodation rather than stay in hospital? Well, it's not so much as the roof as the, as the support and the other stuff that you need, right? Now, you can go from a... You've got somebody in a ward that's quite intensively... Um, uh, looked after with a high staff to patient proportion. You then go to a convalescent home where it's a bit less um, because people are, are less at risk and then they exit home and it's that bit that is missing. But you still need the, mm. the people and of course we're in the middle of a big, like, government's in the middle of a big recruit, I'm not a member of the government now in, but there's, a, there's the government's in a big recruitment campaign of nurses, doctors, all the rest of it into the NHS. Numbers are up very significantly. I think last time I looked 34,000 more nurses um, over the last still decade. More. Right, so they're, they're putting lots in but there is this structural issue you. And I think, um, as I understand it, Steve Barclay is looking at the, this notion of the conveyor belt and how you unlock um, these particular... Thomas, blockages. When, when you refer to it as conveyor belt, it's sort of so impersonal. I know, it? I know, um, but, the, but it, that effectively yeah, it is a no, process, No, no, right? I, I understand. Matthew, do you want to finish off? Yeah, thank you. I mean, my view is, and this is what I've been saying to MPs today, is that I think this should be considered a national emergency, actually. We can't have a situation where the new normal is that people are waiting... Um, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 hours to be seen. I mean, I shall never forget harrowing in my mind what my mum went through in those 11 hours. It's seared on my mind, and that's why I'm absolutely determined to um, raise, raise the matter. But I think we need cross-party stuff on this. I know we're heading towards an election. I know parties want to make their party political points. We live in a thriving democracy. That's quite right. But this should be kind of above party politics. Let's get together. Let's sort the situation out. Right, we will move on to a new subject in just a few minutes' time. 0345 6060973, if you'd like to take part in our discussion here on Cross Question on LBC. But first, let's get the latest news headlines at half past eight with Charlotte Morgan. Downing Street says the decision to call off strikes ahead of Christmas now rests with the unions. The RMT have rejected a pay rise offer and plan to walk out for four days next week and from Christmas Eve to the 27th. Pharmacists are warning a blip in the supply chains affecting the availability of some medicines to treat strep A. It's affecting liquid supplies of the antibiotic penicillin as ministers look at handing out prescriptive drugs to schools reporting cases. It's claimed the UK is sleepwalking into a food supply crisis. The National Farmers Union's called for the government to step in to help with rising fuel, fertiliser and feed costs. LBC weather, some showers along northern coasts, mostly dry elsewhere, lows of minus three. Wintry showers for Northern Ireland tomorrow, some rain in the west, highs of five degrees. This is LBC.
Ask Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 8.34 on LBC. We have with us Matthew Hulbert, who's a Liberal Democrat councillor and health campaigner, Catherine McKinnell, Labour MP for Newcastle-upon-Tyne North, and Kit Malthouse, Conservative MP for North West Hampshire, and Amy Hart. Now, it says here, influencer. Now, one or two people on our text accounts have been saying, influencer, what on earth does that mean? Yep. What does it mean? So, it's someone with usually a social media platform, but it can be a TV platform as well, who uses their platform to influence people it can be to buy certain items of clothing to go on certain holidays i try and use mine to sort of raise awareness of food banks social injustice issues the strikes etc um but it's basically having lots of people a sort of captive audience and using that either for good or for evil so is it uh, instagram your primary yes, means instagram, and how many instagram like followers have uh, you got? 1.1 million i've got eleven thousand. so you're far more influential than i am Eleven thousand, Ian. yeah I, I think I've only got three and a half or something. Yeah, I do, I'm on tic- on do you know this program is now on TikTok? You I are love, now live TikTok. on TikTok. Oh my God, I love TikTok. Um, Should we just do a video instead? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you doing all the TikTok dances, then you'll go no, viral. I, I did say so. I'm but not Ian, doing TikTok dances. You know, Ian's dances. a bit of an influencer. He's trying yes. to turn the world against electric cars. Yes, he is. No, I don't start that. I'm not. I'm just, I have handed my electric car back and I've explained the reasons why. But you have, you have influence. In a very public way. Very sensitive. You are an influencer because my boyfriend wanted an electric car and I was like, I was listening to an old episode of For the Many and it took Ian like 10 hours to get from, was it? Beverly. 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 To Tumbridge Wells. Wells, Because there was no charges and I tell everyone that story so you are an influencer. I'm afraid I haven't done more than anybody else to put people off electric cars. I'm an and I'm, driver. I think I'm ashamed of myself. Right, let's go to another call before I get into even more trouble. Cam is in Nuneaton. Hello, Cam. Good evening, Funnel. Hello. 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 Hi. What's your question? I just wanted to, I, I wanted to ask, um, basically, it was how far should the government push with their, the operation Get Tough? That's on the Just Up Oil protesters, isn't it? Yes. Is it, the, is it really called cool, that Operation Get Tough? They normally have sort of... I mean, this wouldn't have happened in your day in the Home Office kit, would it? Because that's a bit of a, a crass one. It'd be slightly elliptical if you if you were choosing the title. Yeah, in the in normal times, there's a there's a list, so the name is effectively random. Right. Um, that it comes out of the thing. So you would... Yeah, you would have a random name that wasn't necessarily quite as descriptive as they've gone for <laughs> there. But there's obviously some communications expert has got hold of the project and put that name in. Um... Look, obviously, you know, people have a right to protest, but there are boundaries to it. And I think we've seen in in the in recent months, and in fact, the last year or so, that in my view, that boundary has very often been crossed to the extent that sometimes you know lives have been put in danger. I mean, when we've got field protesters strapping themselves to gantries filled with thousands of gallons of highly explosive fuel, um, and indeed putting uh, police officers who have to go up there and recover them, putting their lives in danger too, I think we can all agree that the boundary has been crossed and also when they are blocking motorways so that people even if they are in an ambulance or not are not able to get to a hospital mm. um i mean we've seen protests here uh, stopping people get to st thomas's hospital i think most right thinking people think that is crossing the boundary between my right to go about my business and get to a hospital and all the rest of it and your right to protest and so i do think there's um um you know a case for there to be much swifter and more severe sanctions against those who are protesting. And in fact, I took a public order bill through um, uh, the House of Commons when I was policing minister that did exactly that um, and brought in new offences, for example, these people tunnelling. Again, it was a very dangerous thing to do for themselves and and for people who have to rescue them, making that a severe offence and, and, you know, increasing the penalties in the hope that we might deter these people from their practices. I have to say... You know, that bill was controversial, opposed by quite a lot of people in the House of Commons in the House of Lords, but nevertheless, uh, I think, deemed necessary, and even more so in the light of the process we've seen in the last few days. I think we all know, don't we, broadly, I hope, where the line is between protest... Yes, but we'll all have a different line. That's the thing, isn't, isn't well, it? Well, I'm not sure necessarily we will, actually. I think the vast majority of people... I mean, there are obviously people who support them and think it's, you know, these kind of um, uh, eco-terrorist tactics are, are legitimate. Uh, but I think the vast majority of people actually think that, that, you know, when you've got people who are prevented from getting to hospital and endangering their lives because of these protests... Um, 
that the vast majority of people would, would agree that something needs to be done. Um, Amy, it was up the workers, is it up the gantries as well? No, this is the thing. So everyone has their issue that they're so, so passionate about. And as much as I would not climb M25 bridges or throw paint, no, throw soup over paintings, I mean, they're very creative, these protesters, um, but they have got us talking. If they'd just gone out with placards and stood outside the House of Parliament, would we be talking about them? We wouldn't. So as much as I do think what they're doing is at best annoying, um, because they are sort of stopping everyone, they, they are all very passionate about the issue and they're just trying to get their point across. But if you look at the numbers, I mean, there's, it's a few dozen people. It's the same faces each time. This is not a mass movement, is it? No, and I do wonder whether, because they're all very young, well, a lot of them are very young. There are some older ones, obviously, but I wonder whether they've been sort of influenced and there's brainwashed. People, brainwashed people behind the scenes pulling the strings that aren't going out and gluing themselves to the M25. And, you know, they're the ones that can go on, go on, like lighting the fire under them and letting them go. Um, Catherine, you were nodding during what Kit was saying, I seem to detect. Mm, no, I wasn't agreeing. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, no, I do, no, I mean, I do, I do think there's a lot of cross-party agreement on the need to prevent um, the more dangerous and disruptive aspects of these pro protests. I mean, the most awful story I read was um, a, a, a father and his son that couldn't get to their grandfather's funeral mm -hmm. and it broke my heart listening to that because the idea that you couldn't say goodbye to your loved ones because somebody glued themselves to the road i absolutely empathized with that um i do take issue somewhat with uh kit's characterization of the government's measures that they've taken in relation to protesting because i think they do go too far i think they are not necessary i think the police have the powers to deal with this already i don't think they needed to effectively make all protests that causes a nuisance um, illegal and to really put a chilling effect on our freedom of speech and, and right to protest in this country, which I think is fundamental. But I, I also disagree slightly with um, Amy, um, not that I would ever want to, um, <laughs> because I think that Greta Thunberg was incredibly powerful in her very um, uh, quiet and um, dignified protest yeah, and I right. think raised the awareness of the climate crisis and what we need to do to change it in an incredibly effective way and I think there are many ways you can you can really um, be passionate about these issues without preventing people going to work so that's and, the and without putting police officers All in danger. All protesters need to wear pigtails. That's, that's what you have to do. Matthew. So this is difficult, isn't it? Because I absolutely believe as, uh, as a liberal that people have the right to protest about um, an issue that they feel passionate about. But equally, if, um, and this wasn't the situation, but if a protest had stopped, had been the reason that an ambulance couldn't get to my mum when she was lying on the floor after all those hours, oh. I wouldn't be so happy about that protest. And I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier on in regards to striking workers, that um, protesters have the public sympathy up to a point when they no longer have the public sympathy. And I think we'd just stop oil. I mean, Amy's right that they've got us talking about them. But it's in a pretty negative way, isn't it? No one really talks about them in a positive sense because what they do is so, so disruptive. Um, and so I think, actually, you can protest in a way which gets your point over and gets, hopefully, government and parliament listening without causing such disruption to people that people's lives could actually be in is danger it, because of what you're doing. It is interesting, isn't it, that when Extinction Rebellion first came on the scene, I remember sitting here or wherever I was broadcasting from sort of saying... Well, this is actually quite a refreshing way of doing it. They, they seem to be quite innovative. And then they seem to get taken over by, shall we say, some of the usual suspects. And, and, and again, it was the same faces that you saw doing the sort of traditional, really disruptive protests, rather than the sort of almost street carnivals that they had at the mm. beginning. I think people rather bought into that kit, didn't they? Well, I get, look, the, the, the cause of, of dealing with climate change is one with which almost everybody agrees, right? And the question is, how do you infuse a general population to make the ch different choices in their lives uh, to, to help the planet? And how do you infuse politicians to go even further and faster than they already are? And, you know, we're doing a lot in this country uh, already, in many ways, uh, leading the way, particularly on the eradication of, of coal. Um, but the, the this crowd seemed to be just so... Um, 
uh, zealous and absolutist in what they want, that they won't brook mm. any sense of uh, of compromise with the rest of us. Um, and as a result, I mean, they're turning a lot of people off. It's not very long ago, and you'll remember those people who climbed on top of carriages at, uh, yeah. at Canning Town that were dragged off by ordinary working people that just wanted to get to work. Uh, and my that, worry is not uh, necessarily I'm, just... Ironic the, protesting on the most environmentally friendly railway yeah. in the country. Yeah. Indeed. And, and then you get into the situation where, I, I forget who that poor woman was who was so frustrated about getting her kids to school that she nudged them with a car and ended up getting done for us yeah. off. And so you end up with these very, very tense situations. And I know a lot of people look at footage that's coming from Italy and France where the police are just getting in there and dragging them off and throwing them on the side of the road and thinking, well, you know, we could do with a bit of that. So it, it's, it's you know, it's it's a very Speak difficult... Speak to my partner, it'd be more than dragging them off the well, road, Well, it's a I very difficult and challenging situation. <laughs> While I totally agree, you know, okay. is fundamental to our rights in this country, there are boundaries. Right. And we're I've just got, trying to set where those boundaries are. I've got three questions I want to get through before nine o'clock so i'm going to ask you all to be a little bit briefer in your answers in the next section of the program it's coming up to 8 45 lbc nick ferrari at breakfast this harry and megan trailer for the documentary he's all over the place poor young man holding his head in agony why put yourself through it unless it is all part of the grieving process natasha and putney i think it's all about her wanting to be popular her wanting to make money out of her husband and they're not going to stop until they've made their billions i want you to talk to sarah please natasha she's in new york city when I read a British paper and it says palace sources and it's always negative against Harry and Meghan. If those sources exist that Harry and Meghan are only responding, you cannot say that they are without consequence to her life. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. Um. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. Kit Malthouse, Catherine McKinnell, Amy Hart and Matthew Holbert with us answering your questions. Here's a text question from Mike in Paul. Will your panel have their eyes glued to their TV screens when Harry and Meghan release their new documentary? Uh, Catherine. No. Um... I find it incredibly uncomfortable, all of this. I really find the media frenzy for it quite uncomfortable. Sorry, I know I'm on the media. Um, I think at the heart of this is a 
very painful family breakdown, um, breakdown in the relationship. And it's inc- I find it incredibly uncomfortable to watch, incredibly sad. It's obviously linked to Harry's mom and what happened with her. And, you know, very painful um, past, very painful present. And, um, you know, I get why the uh, public are so fascinated by it and I get why people will be glued to it, but I won't be. You see, I agree with every word you've just said, but I will be. <laughs> I get that. I, I get that. I think it. Will. You know, it's it's up to people um, what they do, but I, I find it, I find it really painful. I really okay. do. Matthew. So I will be watching it, um, but um, I'm part of a minority, albeit a growing minority, every day that believes actually that we um, shouldn't have an unelected hereditary. Uh, monarch that we should have an elected head of state and um, I know political parties don't like to talk about it because of how popular the royal family are but um, and it's certainly not the Lib Dem policy position but I'm here just as myself tonight so I'm going to tell you what I think and um, I hope this um, reveals the some of the truth uh, uh, about what happens behind the scenes about our monarchy and brings the institution down. Okay uh, Amy I wasn't like quite expecting that. I was expecting uh, insurrection um, <laughs> on this show. Just you know like, the Tower of London is only two miles down the road. Exactly. Watch yourself. I'm heading there shortly. Yeah. <laughs> I'd just like to preface this by saying lots of people think that Love Islanders are morons, but I'm an oxymoron because I am a socialist, but also a massive royalist. Like, I love You're all over the, royal the place, family. frankly, aren't you? I, li- I am yeah. mess. I'm a yeah. hot mess. Um, and I have so a many massive... Ways. <laughs> I have a massive issue with Prince Harry. Like, she can, Megan can, you know, whatever. But he, two things. Number one, to go on television, global television, in the middle of a global pandemic when people are losing their jobs, using food banks, mm. living in poverty, mm. and say, at 37 years old, my dad cut me off financially and all I have left to live on is the £31 million pounds that my mum left me. Oh, I feel really sorry for you. I'm really sorry about that. And also, my dad lost his mum eight years ago and I know how horrendous that was for him. Prince Charles, uh, King, sorry, King Charles, um, he has lost his mum and whether or not he is the king, whether or not, you know, he had to start a new job the next day, have a bit of sympathy for your dad. At the end of the day, he's still your dad and he's just lost his mum and all of this is horrendous. Mm. Mm. Good. I think they should get over themselves. I completely yeah. agree with you. I mean, talk about first world problems. There they are sitting in this massive multi-million dollar mansion uh, complaining about how awful their lives are. Um, I just find it kind of tasteless, really. I, and so I won't be watching. And I also, to be honest with you, looking behind it, right, all this stuff, that they're doing it for money. Yeah. Mm. Right, it's not like it, they're trying to do... I mean, when Harry did the Invictus Games and all that fantastic stuff for veterans, right, and when, when he and William and, and Kate talked about mental health issues, and they didn't do it for money. This is kind of, as I think somebody said in the Daily Mail today, monetizing their misery, and I find it all a bit tasteless, really. But, but let's not get pious and pompous about this. I'm I mean, pious you know, and pompous. You know, you know, no. you know, I'm telling you what my view is. You know, in terms, in, terms of, in terms of William and Kate, you know, they recently um, did their Earthshot thing in, in America, but didn't fly the winners over. They, they just flew the celebrities over. I mean, come off it. I mean, you know, so I hope this um, programme really lifts the lid on this institution. And I really wish that political, that some in political parties would be brave enough to say it's not good enough today if we shouldn't have an elected house of lords if we shouldn't have an unelected house of lords which we shouldn't they should be elected we should also have an elected head of state surely and no political party will ever talk about it why not because they're magical because the we don't think magical. Magical. <laughs> magical. no because i think having a, a constitutional monarch has worked for us remarkably well over the, and provided stability over many decades and decades and i think it works better than having a, an elected and therefore partisan president yeah. oh it works in ireland come off it it works in germany of course it could happen here thing is we don't actually need to watch the show because it will be everywhere mm. all over the media so yeah. you don't actually need to waste it you, you could literally you can literally just read it on your phone this is probably going to be the last mention it gets on this program <laughs> i have to say right um let's move on to another money-making exercise uh <laughs> hannah in east grinstead says matt hancock officially launched his new book pandemic diaries today should he be capitalizing off his role in the pandemic and do you trust his version of events no. a- amy no, I don't at all. Um, I think he 
was ridiculous for going on I'm a Celebrity. He's not a celebrity. He's an elected member of parliament. What about his constituents? He shouldn't have gone on there. And this is like a big glossy autobiography. Is he going to start like doing book signings and things? Like, no, I, imagine I don't he like is. it. Um, I think that, you know, so many people suffered because of choices he made. And I understand that on the other hand, he had to make these choices and every choice you make in life has a 50-50 chance of being the correct choice. But I think, yeah, monetizing off of other people's misery. Well, he would argue were he here, but of course he's not here. He's not doing any broadcast interviews on the book, which if I were his publisher, and I very well could have been because it's been published by my old company, I would have been furious with him for not publicizing it in broadcast interviews, but he, he's not. But the money that he's making from this, he says, or at least some of it, is being donated to charities. Now, he hasn't said what proportion, um, and we will find out how much money he gets from it because it'll be published in the Register Member's Interest. So we, we can't just assume that he's pocketing the dosh himself. I think it's all, um, all just him trying to rebrand himself. I think he knows that he's like messed up massively during the pandemic, just of like how he used to be in interviews and that like fake crying thing. Um, I think this is him, I'm a celebrity, followed by the book, is him just trying to rebrand himself. As, See, I'm a, I'm a good guy, really. I'm a good well, guy, really. Well, it worked really. on I'm a celebrity, didn't it? It did, sadly. Kit? Well, I'm pleased to hear that he's donating the proceeds to charity, and I agree with you. I think it would be um, it would be a, a strange thing for him to seek to make a profit out of that thing. So let's see what proportion. Hopefully, it'll be all the money that he makes. Um, and I gather, I think I I understand he didn't actually keep a diary, so it's a sort of as they would say, a BBC reconstruction of what happened. Um, and as somebody much wiser and uh, more senior than me, uh, Hereditary said, uh, recollections may vary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed you didn't use the well-worn phrase trusted and valued colleague there. Uh, Matthew? Well, I mean, you know, I just try not to think about the man. I think he's dreadful. Um, and, um, you know, I, I stopped watching I'm a Celebrity when he appeared, which is <clears throat> a great shame for me because it deprived me I'm of watching. I'm virtually signalling off you. It's, uh, <laughs> thank you, Ian. I need you to say that. Um, it, it, but uh, it was quite a sacrifice for me because it stopped me from being able to see Owen Warner, who was my personal uh, favourite. Enough. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, but, but no, seriously, I mean, I think he shouldn't have gone on there, as Amy says, because what about his constituents? I mean, I appreciate that MPs have office staff, but really, his job was to be in Parliament and in his constituency representing his constituents and I think he needs to choose now between whether he's going to be a celebrity in which case he needs to stand down from Parliament and go off and do the SAS show and all of that or he's actually he's already a, done that it's, that's already in the well, can you know what I mean I yeah. thought that was in I thought he did I'm a celebrity instead of SAS he's no, done no, that no, he's, 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 he's actually done, done that oh, he's, and apparently he's, 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 he's won it Really? Should I, should I have said that? Yeah. <laughs> Is Catherine? Uh, I mean, I think he should give his testimony to the COVID inquiry. Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be um, a very serious look at what happened during COVID. I don't think it's to uh, be uh, profited from in any way, whether that's PPE contracts, PPE contracts for your mates, or publishing a book in order to make money from it. And I don't think that anyone should rely on any one individual's account of what happened during that pandemic, we should have an independent inquiry that give the families we have, that suffered we, we have, hugely we have got one. the comfort but, but of he, that. If he's not going of to... Of at least knowing the if, truth of what happened. If he's not going to benefit financially from the book, and it does go to charity... Well, you haven't said, yeah. Well... I don't know whether... Mm. But he said he's giving at least some of it to charity. Isn't it a good thing for somebody to put on the record what they did and why they did it. You may not agree with it, but surely it's a good thing for that to be done. I think it's too soon. I think this is still very painful for the families. I think we need to conclude the COVID inquiry and see what um, the facts are established by an independent um, body that is looking at it. I think... I, um, so you think this is a preemptive strike? I think basically. it's a preemptive strike to, okay. to attempt right. to potentially rewrite history, and I don't think it's his place now, to do know, that. I think he should be apologising. At the end of each of these programmes, we do a fun text question, which oh. usually strikes fear into the heart of everybody, particularly when I don't tell you what it is beforehand. Uh, Brandon in Hull says, Matt Lucas is leaving Bake Off. Me and the wife are devastated. Can your panel think of anyone who could replace him? Um, I met Matt Lucas at the Euro finals last year and um, he, he was an absolutely delightful guy. I'd never met him before and uh, we sort of became friends and I sort of be, have been sending him ABBA remixes ever oh. since. 
bizarrely. Amy, who would you replace him with? Um, Matt, Hancock. No. Matt Hancock. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's now a reality TV stalwart. Yeah, like um, no, Miriam Margulies, obviously. Oh my God, <laughs> she's fantastic. What she would. I love her. Look, Miriam. She's, she's one person I want to get on this show. Fantastic. So there you are, Corey. There's a challenge for you. Miriam Margulies on Cross Question. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, Kit. I think you'd be good on it, Ian. I, I bet you're a dad man. No, I'm not. I can't cook. But that's what's fun, right? Mm. That's what we want to see. A bit of a soggy bottom and all that stuff. Jackie. Well, I'm your man, Jackie. then. Jackie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jackie Smith and yeah. Ian Dale on Bake Off. Yeah, that would be great. But if the yeah. producers are watching, we're up for it. Matthew. Well, you don't look unlike him, Ian. <laughs> Matt Lucas. So I think... <laughs> Carl, well, you're not coming back on this show. I was going to say, that's me, that's, me never, that's me never coming back. But um, I'm well, really the sad... I'm that... a foot taller than <laughs> I'm really sad that he's going, actually, because, uh, you know, he's he's real fun, him and Noel Fielding. So maybe Sandy Tox will be back. I, I hope she... I believe mm. she's been ill. I hope she gets better and maybe she could come back. Former ABC presenter, Catherine. Well, I think I'm a celebrity is completely um, over now that Man Hock's been in there, so I think Ant and Deck should get themselves on the Bake Off. Mm -hmm. That'd be entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've all been very entertaining. Thank you very much indeed. Matthew Holbert, Catherine McKinnell, Amy Hart and Kit Malta.